The last Undertaker video uploaded on this channel left off in October of 1998. The dead man was in the middle of a feud over the vacant WWF Championship and he had just had a match with his younger brother Kane at Judgment Day. After this pay-per-view event, the Ministry of Darkness faction and storyline would get kick-started. I didn't want to leave this video waiting any longer as it seemed many people were eager for this next part of The Undertaker's career, so let's get stuck in as we look at The Undertaker and the Ministry of Darkness. We need to go back to Judgment Day to get a full picture here. The Undertaker took on Kane for the vacant WWF Championship with Stone Cold Steve Austin acting as the referee. We already know that the match ended with no clear outcome thanks to Steve Austin declaring himself as the winner, but something else happened during this match that is very noteworthy. In the closing moments of the match, Paul Bearer came to ringside holding a chair. He got in the ring and it looked like he was going to hit The Undertaker, but Paul Bearer would hit his son Kane while Kane's back was turned. Paul Bearer then invited The Undertaker to pin Kane, but Steve Austin wouldn't count the pin attempt. The match ended then with Austin counting to three while both men were led out on the mat, so we would need to tune into Raw the very next night to see what was going on. Stone Cold Steve Austin was also fired by Vince McMahon on this night, the very first time McMahon said his infamous you're fired catchphrase, and the WWF Championship still didn't have a rightful owner. The next night on Raw saw Steve Austin take Vince McMahon hostage in one of the more memorable episodes, but before all this happened, Vince McMahon kicked the show off with an announcement. Vince said that because of Steve Austin, the WWF has no champion and therefore, the upcoming Survivor Series pay-per-view will host a 16-man tournament to crown a new champion. Later in the show, The Undertaker had an interview segment and walking side by side with the dead man was Paul Bearer once again. Taker got in the ring and said a reconciliation had been made and The Undertaker said that Paul Bearer has come home to lead the dead man's Ministry of Darkness. Undertaker said that he's sure that many people out there couldn't understand why he would realign himself with such a despicable, evil, maniacal individual, but Undertaker explained that Paul Bearer allowed him to clear his head and refocus on what he was in the WWF for. Taker said this is a new era and the Ministry of Darkness will unleash a plague on the World Wrestling Federation. Paul Bearer took the mic and explained that he used Kane like a little pet and because Kane could never see and understand the true darkness, Paul Bearer had no further use for the Big Red Machine. Undertaker then dropped a huge announcement when he said it was he himself that caused Kane to get burned in the fire all those years ago at the funeral home, saying he did it because Kane was weak and only the strong survive. Kane came out to the entranceway pushing a casket, going on to challenge Undertaker to a casket match later in the evening and telling the dead man that he will rest in peace. The casket match ended with no winner. Undertaker and Paul Bearer just walked away to the backstage area during the bout. It was revealed the next week that Stone Cold Steve Austin had been rehired thanks to Shane McMahon, leading to Shane giving one of the absolute best promos of his career here, with Shane saying he's tired of seeing superstars come and go because of his father's ego. We'll talk about Shane in another video though, all you need to know is Steve Austin was back and later that evening he had a match with Ken Shamrock. Vince McMahon's stooges tried to make life difficult for Stone Cold, but Mick Foley evened the odds by putting Shamrock in the mandible claw. Steve Austin got in the ring, he smacked Shamrock with a steel chair and Stone Cold won the match. Austin delivered stunners to Patterson, Briscoe and Sergeant Slaughter and the show went off the air. The next week, Vince McMahon punished the Stooges by locking them inside a steel cage with the big boss man. The boss man destroyed Briscoe, Patterson and Slaughter but the beating stopped after Stone Cold Steve Austin and eventually Shane McMahon hit the ring. When Austin was left in the cage on his own, The Undertaker and Paul Bearer came down the ramp. Taker locked himself inside the cage with Austin and a fight broke out between the Phenom and the Texas Rattlesnake. When Undertaker got the upper hand, 
Kane showed up and he set the cage on fire with his pyro. The show went off the air with all three men brawling in the flaming steel cage. And yes, I totally missed this in my Big Blue Steel Cage video, apologies for that. Undertaker and Kane met at the Survivor Series Deadly Game Tournament, with both men getting buys into the quarterfinals. Undertaker got the win here thanks to Paul Bearer, so the dead man went to the semi-finals to square off with The Rock. Because Kane came to the ring and chokeslammed The Rock, The Undertaker got disqualified and eliminated from the tournament. Taker and Kane fought through the audience, and The Rock went on to win the tournament and the WWF Championship when he aligned himself with Vince McMahon. The Rock became the corporate champion, as Vince was now adding more wrestlers to his very own faction, known as the Corporation. So The Undertaker was then booked into a Buried Alive match with Steve Austin and this would occur at rock bottom in your house. On the November 16th episode of Raw, Undertaker hit Steve Austin with a shovel which caused Stone Cold some problems the following week. In storyline, Steve Austin had blacked out during a live event. The 23rd of November episode of WWF Raw then showed us Steve Austin getting treated at a hospital and later in the show, The Undertaker and Paul Bearer infiltrated the hospital, leading to Austin getting knocked out and brought to a nearby open grave. Undertaker decided not to bury Stone Cold but instead he would embalm Austin alive. Taker, Austin and Bearer then went to the funeral home and The Undertaker showed the first sides of his more satanic character when he began speaking in tongues. Anyway, Kane showed up to stop the festivities, the feed was interrupted and we went back to the arena. The following week, Steve Austin was looking for The Undertaker backstage and he bumped into this woman and asked her if she had seen The Undertaker, to which she replied no. This young lady here is Stephanie McMahon and she'd be used in this storyline as time went on. Anyway, Stone Cold continued his search for the dead man, but he ended up getting locked in a freezer room by Paul Bearer and The Taker. Undertaker went to the ring and said that his plague in the WWF was growing stronger and stronger, his Ministry of Darkness also grows stronger, but Steve Austin and Kane are getting in his way. Taker said he will take care of Austin at rock bottom, and Kane would be dealt with later on this evening. Kane came to the ring, the two began brawling, and a bunch of men in white coats came to the ring holding a straitjacket, threatening to take Kane away here to what we assume would be some sort of mental asylum. Kane escaped as Paul Bearer laughed on the rampway. Undertaker and Bearer found Kane later on, and Undertaker instructed Paul Bearer to go get the white coats while Taker put Kane in a body bag. With Paul Bearer gone, Steve Austin showed up and took out the Undertaker. Paul Bear returned with the white coats and took the body bag away. Paul checked to see if Kane was still in there, and later we saw Paul Bear wave bye bye as the body bag was taken away. What Paul didn't know though was that he just waved goodbye to The Undertaker. Taker was in the body bag, not Kane, and now Austin and the Big Red Machine were coming after Paul Bear. Austin and Kane dragged Paul Bear to the ring later in the evening to cut a promo, and then they took Paul outside and put him in the sewers of Baltimore. A great episode of Raw here, this one was loads of fun to go back and watch. The next week though, on the December 7th 1998 edition of Raw, we would get treated to one of The Undertaker's most well remembered moments, not just of this heel run, but of all time. The Undertaker took part in a star studded tag team main event, teaming up with The Rock to face Stone Cold Steve Austin and Mankind, but before this match took place, Steve Austin had an in ring promo to kick off the second hour of Raw. The Undertaker's voice interrupted Stone Cold, the Prince of Darkness said that Steve Austin will be sacrificed to the Ministry of Darkness, and a giant Undertaker symbol was set alight on the entranceway. Later on, during the tag main event, The Undertaker carried Austin up the rampway where Taker's druids were waiting to put Austin on the Undertaker symbol. Austin was strapped up, and the symbol began rising, hanging over The Undertaker and giving us this incredible visual right here. Truly unforgettable. 
So we arrive at rock bottom, Undertaker vs Steve Austin in a buried alive match. The WWF had done a fantastic job in building this one up and the match itself was good. I feel it was much better than their SummerSlam 1998 encounter, having a clear babyface and a clear heel here made things more enjoyable when it came to Austin vs Taker. And also, Austin didn't get knocked out during this match so that obviously helps. While Taker had been a heel during his early days in the WWF, this Undertaker was way, way different. The Prince of Darkness was now established as a more aggressive and more evil version of the Undertaker gimmick and it worked incredibly well, however things were only really beginning for this new demonic Undertaker. Austin and Taker battled all around the arena here and towards the end of the match, an explosion occurred from inside the grave. Kane appeared and he launched an attack on The Undertaker. Undertaker got distracted when Steve Austin brought a digger to the gravesite and it seemed like the driver had some real problems trying to operate the machinery that would help bury The Undertaker alive. You need to watch this back, you can hear Stone Cold getting frustrated with the whole ordeal and referee Earl Hebner just ended up raising Stone Cold's hand in victory and the show went off the air. After the Buried Alive match, we would not see The Undertaker for a few weeks. Elsewhere on the World Wrestling Federation cards, Ron Simmons and Bradshaw had formed The Acolytes, a tag team that was managed by The Jackal, better known as Don Callis. The Jackal had been on commentary talking about being a puppet master that controls everything from the shadows and so it's widely believed that the Jackal would be revealed as the higher power behind The Undertaker's Ministry of Darkness. We would never find out though, Don Callis left the WWF at the end of 1998. So on the December 28th 1998 episode of Raw, we saw Dennis Knight backstage talking to Axe Pac and Dennis told Axe Pac he was at Raw because he said to be here, not revealing who he was. Dennis had worked in the WWF previously as Phineas Godwin and backstage he was also good friends with The Undertaker. Anyway, later in the evening, Dennis was attacked and abducted by the Acolytes. No reason at all was given for Bradshaw and Farouk's actions here. On the January 11th, 1999 edition of Raw, Dennis Knight was placed on an altar with the Acolytes beside him. The Undertaker's music played and the Prince of Darkness returned here alongside Paul Bearer. Undertaker spoke to the audience, saying people thought that burying him alive would be the end of The Undertaker, but instead, people had now sent The Undertaker back to his place of origin. Taker said he had risen from the grave to slay the ones he once saved, and the reckoning was now upon us. Undertaker said that he will share his power of darkness with a chosen few, confirming here that the men sharing the stage with him were now part of the new Ministry of Darkness stable. Taker then approached Dennis Knight, speaking in tongues as he took a knife from Paul Bearer. Undertaker made a cut and he renamed Dennis Knight as Midian. After carving the Undertaker symbol onto Midian, Undertaker told us all that we're going to learn why we are afraid of the dark as the Undertaker's symbol went up in flames. So yeah, this was the official reveal of the Ministry stable and Undertaker had now gone 100% demonic. This sort of thing was sure to raise a few complaints from the more good living folk among us. The segment worked wonders for WWF audiences however as the pop was insane the next week for The Undertaker. Even though he was a heel here, the whole Ministry of Darkness thing had really caught on in a huge way. With Bradshaw, Farouk, Paul Bearer and the delirious Midian beside him, The Undertaker sat on the stage and said that the sacrifices aren't over, someone would join the ministry that Sunday at the 1999 Royal Rumble. During the Rumble match itself then, Mabel came out as the 11th entrant. The lights went out, The Undertaker's theme music played in the arena and when the lights came back on we saw the acolytes and Midian attacking Mabel. Undertaker came out and the Taker's gaze seemed to play with Mabel's mind, almost hypnotising him. The remaining members of the Ministry then continued their attack, all men disappeared back through the curtain and the Royal Rumble match continued. We later saw Mabel getting loaded into a hearse and the next night Mabel was reintroduced as Viscera. So this was the core ministry team here, the Acolytes, Midian, Mabel, Paul Bearer and The Undertaker. The faction was being used here to give maybe lesser stars something to sink their teeth into with The Undertaker giving these guys credibility through association. 
Taker, Midian and Viscera were scheduled to take on The Brood on the February 1st 1999 edition of Raw but Taker decided to sit it out and let his minions do his dirty work. The match ended when the Acolytes came down to help Midian and Viscera destroy The Brood and strangely The Brood pushed WWF officials away when they tried to help them. After Gangrel, Edge and Christian were annihilated by the Ministry of Darkness, The Undertaker came to the ring to get a better view of the carnage. Later in the evening, the Acolytes defeated Al Snow in the Road Dog, and after the match, the Ministry and the Druids came to the ring. The Undertaker stood at the entranceway and he ordered the Druids to remove their hoods, and it was revealed that Edge, Gangrel and Christian, the Brood, were now also members of the Ministry of Darkness. This explained why the Brood pushed WWF officials away during the brawl with the Ministry. Their beating in the ring was an initiation. Our next pay-per-view was the St Valentine's Day Massacre show on February 14th 1999 and The Undertaker had a meeting backstage with the Ministry of Darkness here. Undertaker said that Midian would take the boss man's soul during his scheduled match and The Taker also said that the power from beyond had spoken to him, saying that the Ministry's purpose in life begins on that very night. Bossman ended up defeating Midian, but after the match, the Ministry surrounded the ring, leading to Viscera splashing the Bossman multiple times and the Bossman getting carried away by the Ministry of Darkness. Fans assumed here that this meant the Bossman would now be added to the Ministry, but no. The Ministry taking out the Corporation's Bossman meant the Ministry now had a new enemy, Vince McMahon himself. Michael Cole said on commentary the next night that the Bossman managed to escape. The entire ministry came out then on the February 15th edition of Raw as The Undertaker had an announcement to make. The ministry's mission was to now take over the entire World Wrestling Federation. Undertaker said that one by one, everyone in the WWF would fall to the ministry and the beating the boss man took was proof that there's nothing Vince McMahon can do about the upcoming destruction of the WWF. Undertaker then said that each soul that the Ministry takes, they take in the name of the Higher Power, a power that is even greater than himself, and through this greater power, the Undertaker will own the World Wrestling Federation. Taker also said that the Ministry and the Higher Power own the key to Vince McMahon's heart and soul, but a little more on that later. So the feud had been set up, the Ministry versus the Corporation, a bit of an odd setup here as both factions were heels but still it didn't matter, this was entertaining. Things would get more and more interesting though as the weeks went on. Corporation members Ken Shamrock, Test and The Boss Man took on Midian and the Acolytes later in the night. The match got interrupted by The Undertaker coming to the stage, holding on to an abducted Shane McMahon. Shane played the part well here, he was scared, he was shaking, he thought The Undertaker was going to sacrifice him but instead, The Undertaker gave Shane a letter along with orders to give the letter to Vince. Vince ended up booking the second ever Inferno match in WWF history for the following week's Raw. Undertaker vs Kane would wrestle again in a ring surrounded by flames. I should also note that Kane had joined the corporation after Vince McMahon promised him that his membership also included the promise of never having to go to a mental asylum. I thought the first Inferno match was better here and I think that comes down to seeing the match for the very first time and the intrigue that comes with that. And along with this, this second Inferno match here had a lot of other stuff going on around ringside to distract viewers but still, it was good to see The Undertaker wrestle again on TV. He hadn't had a proper televised match since rock bottom back in December of 1998, at least one where he got in the ring anyway. A few things happened before the Inferno match though. Firstly, the Brood were disciplined by the other Ministry members after Gangrel and Edge lost a tag team match against the Public Enemy. And The Undertaker delivered a backstage promo where he again spoke about the higher power and owning the key to Vince's heart and soul. During the Inferno match, Vince McMahon revealed on commentary that the letter Shane McMahon delivered to him was of a very personal nature and not something he wanted discussed on TV. But things would get more cryptic when Paul Bearer delivered a box to McMahon at the commentary table. Vince opened the box, it contained a teddy bear, and the sight of the teddy seemed to upset Vince McMahon, causing him to leave the commentary table as the Inferno match continued. 
Anyway, Kane's foot was set on fire this time, and after the match, Undertaker grabbed the teddy bear from a distraught Vince McMahon, setting it alight and bringing the owner of the WWF to his knees. The next week on Raw, Undertaker had a match with Mankind and it was also announced that the Phenom would face the boss man at Wrestlemania inside Hell in a Cell. During the Mankind match, the Undertaker went after Vince McMahon which gave the boss man a chance to launch a sneak attack. The March 8th episode of Raw saw Undertaker once again putting someone up on the giant Undertaker symbol, although this one isn't remembered as well as the Steve Austin segment. This time, Undertaker's WrestleMania opponent, the big boss man, done the honours. However, boss man was able to break free from the symbol. This led to the corporation running out to help the boss man and also the police got involved. The cops wanted to arrest the Undertaker and after Taker instructed Paul Bearer to make a phone call, the Undertaker put his hands out and allowed the police to arrest him. Vince McMahon gloated as the Undertaker was put into a police car backstage, but it looked like the Undertaker had a few plans up his sleeve here. The following week's Raw then, Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon walked back up the entranceway after Shane's match with the Stooges. A video on the Titantron appeared showing the Ministry of Darkness live at Vince McMahon's home. Vince went backstage and he attempted to call police but they thought it was a publicity stunt. When we got back from commercial, The Undertaker phoned Vince McMahon saying it's nearly 10 o'clock and does Vince McMahon know where his family is? Later in the evening, we saw the Undertaker symbol burning outside Vince's house and the Taker said that he is waiting for her to come home. Triple H, meanwhile, was having some problems with Kane and Hunter called the big red machine out towards the end of the show. Kane came out to fight with Triple H and during the brawl, Vince McMahon came to ringside and he pleaded with Kane to talk with his older brother. Kane then removed his mask, and this wasn't Kane, this was The Undertaker. Undertaker grabbed Vince McMahon, the lights went out, and when the lights came back on, Vince was left standing in the ring, looking seriously shook up. Let's skip ahead then to WrestleMania 15, and yeah, not one of The Undertaker's better WrestleMania matches here. It was cool at the time to see a Hell in a Cell match at WrestleMania, and there were enough elements here to make this memorable, but I think it comes down to The Undertaker's opponent here, the big boss man, not being as high on the cards as what he once was. Bossman could still go here, don't get me wrong, but for a Hell in a Cell match at WrestleMania in 1999, I think there may have been better choices to face Undertaker here. Add in the fact that expectations were ridiculously high thanks to the Mankind vs Undertaker Cell match from the year prior, and yeah, this was maybe doomed before it even started. I'll say this though, a lot of people comment on these Taker videos about the Phenom's attires and his different looks over the years. His entrance in ring attire at WrestleMania 15 is definitely one of my favourites. Anyway, Undertaker gets the win with the Tombstone in a pretty unremarkable match. People remember the ending though, the Brood appeared from the rafters and they dropped a noose into the ring. Undertaker grabbed it, he put it around Bossman's neck, and Paul Bearer made the sail rise. And yeah, the boss man was left hanging from the hell in a cell structure at WrestleMania. Steve Austin won the WWF Championship at WrestleMania 15 and the next night on Raw, Austin said he would relinquish the belt. Stone Cold handed the belt to Vince McMahon, but afterwards, Austin revealed he wasn't giving up the title, just the title belt. Stone Cold wanted his custom made smoking skull belt back from Vince McMahon, which was apparently at Vince's home. Later on, Stephanie McMahon, Vince's daughter, was backstage with Vince and Shane and Vince told Stephanie to ring home and get the championship belt back to the arena. Back in the ring, the ministry called out Vince threatening to hurt Sable if he didn't hurry up. When Vince came out, he quickly realised that Stephanie could be in trouble backstage. Vince just ran back to his room and Stephanie had vanished. 
Ken Shamrock managed to find her a little later on after persuading brood member Christian to reveal her location and Stephanie was returned to Vince McMahon. The smoking skull belt was delivered, Vince left the arena with Stephanie, but The Rock and Shane McMahon would end up holding on to the smoking skull belt for a little while longer. Shane was defying Vince's orders here when Vince told Shane just to give it to Steve Austin. The next week, Undertaker promised to capture Stephanie once again, only this time, The Undertaker would sacrifice Stephanie. For revealing Stephanie's whereabouts the week before, Christian was punished by The Undertaker and the rest of the ministry a little later on, and Ken Shamrock was also thrown into a car and abducted by the ministry. To end the show, Undertaker didn't sacrifice Stephanie, but instead, the ministry sacrificed Ryan Shamrock. Undertaker sent the message here though he wasn't about to give up serving his higher power just yet. The next week, Shane McMahon took charge of what he called the new corporation as it seemed Vince was too busy protecting Stephanie. Ken Shamrock questioned Shane about where the corporation was when he was abducted and where was the corporation when his sister got sacrificed the week prior, but Shane promised to give Ken an answer later on. Shane also fired Jerry Briscoe and Pat Patterson during this segment, getting out with the old and in with the new, and to finally solidify himself as the leader of the corporation, he slapped Vince in the face while saying Vince McMahon had his priorities all out of order. Later in the evening, Ken Shamrock was about to get sacrificed, but Undertaker attacked Christian before the deed could be done. The Undertaker ordered Gangrel and Edge to sacrifice Christian also, but the Brood members refused and a fight broke out within the Ministry of Darkness. The Undertaker disappeared as the fight went on and the Brood had now officially left the Ministry. I think this was for the best. The Brood were already unique enough and had gotten pretty popular without the Ministry. Still, they were a nice addition but I also think they could just do fine on their own. To end the show, Ken Shamrock called out The Undertaker and this led to the Ministry laying a beating into the world's most dangerous man. We thought Triple H and Boss Man were about to save Shamrock, but instead, the corporation members continued beating up Shamrock as Shane McMahon looked on with a smile. The April 19th edition of Raw then, The Undertaker orders the Acolytes to destroy the Brood in their tag match. Ken Shamrock interfered in the match, so the Acolytes were unable to complete their mission. Undertaker was annoyed backstage, leading to Viscera and Taker beating up Farouk and Bradshaw after the match. Later on, Midian spooked Vince and Stephanie while the McMahons were conducting a sit-down interview, leading to an all-out assault by Vince McMahon. At the Backlash pay-per-view then later that week, The Undertaker told the Ministry that they must now prepare for the arrival of the higher power. Before the main event match that pitted The Rock against Steve Austin, Vince McMahon had Stephanie wait in a limousine until the end of the pay-per-view. After the main event, the cameras went back to the limo and because the Ministry of Darkness just appeared, the security guys ordered the limousine to drive away. We got a view from inside Stephanie's ride. The Undertaker was revealed as the driver. The Ministry of Darkness had finally kidnapped Stephanie McMahon. Where to, Stephanie? <laughs> the next night, the Ministry got ready to sacrifice Stephanie. Undertaker had requested that Vince McMahon hand over the paperwork that would ultimately give the dead man complete control of the World Wrestling Federation, but when Vince tried to get the papers delivered, The Undertaker was not there. And so, the sacrifice was scheduled to happen during the last segment of Raw. When Stephanie got brought into the ring, it was revealed that she would not get sacrificed after all, but instead, she was about to enter an unholy union with The Undertaker when the two got wed. Ken Shamrock tried to stop the marriage, Big Show tried to stop the marriage, but it was Stone Cold Steve Austin who ran in and put an end to the ceremony. The commentator said Austin isn't helping Stephanie for Vince McMahon, but Austin was saving Stephanie as it was the right thing to do. And this is where today's video ends, because the Ministry of Darkness would change in a big way in just a few days. A new faction was formed when the Ministry merged with Shane McMahon's corporation, giving us the Corporate Ministry. 
On the pilot episode of Smackdown, this super group of heels would come together and very soon the higher power that The Undertaker had been speaking about would also get announced. I'm sure you all know who it was. The very next upload on this channel will be the corporate ministry video, you won't have to wait long. Remember to subscribe and press that little bell icon if you want a notification of when the corporate ministry video is available for viewing, but trust me, it won't be long. Thanks very much for watching.